So I'm Jules Tasharoff. I'm the director for a and business development for Chase Office Interiors. Um, I do confess just out of the gates to be a really judgy designer where it comes to uh, uh, <laughs> Zoom backgrounds. And uh, <laughs> I'm in a terrible hotel in Grand Prairie. So um, there literally wasn't one piece of art that I wanted to put in the background. So you get, you get the lovely beige. Um, so thank you again for joining the Chase webinar series. We uh, continue to have some amazing momentum with this. So attendance rising every single time, which is, uh, it's fantastic. Today's topic, the topic is specifying for drapery, fabric to fabrication. Obviously it's CEU um, accredited. And thanks once again for your patience. We had a few little technical di difficulties out of the oh, there. So uh, we've got a, it's a 45 minute presentation as usual. We'll do a 10 minute question period at the end there. Um, if you do have any questions as we go along, um, just send them through chat for me and uh, we'll have a look at them at the end. Uh, just get that off my screen. There we go. Um, if you've got, uh, if, if it's a CU accredited course, so obviously if you've given us your um, IDIC, IDCC number at your registration at the registration time, we'll get your, your credit processed um, and you'll see that in your inbox in five days or so there. Uh, you've seen on the screen that this has been recorded, so uh, it will be ready at um, on our website within about 72 hours, sometimes earlier. That's obviously chaseoffice.ca forward slash events, as usual. Um, before we jump into this one, please, just a reminder to register for our next one. Um, it's also CEU accredited. It's on April the 20th. It's changed. The topic's changed. So if you go ahead and you, you book in advance, then you'll see... Um, that this one has changed it's actually called feeling good to feeling well now and it's brought to us by technion um so without further ado let's get underway so uh we are delighted to introduce today's presenters we have uh, leah van loan she's the executive uh, vice president from carnegie uh, leah's worked in the commercial furniture and fabrics industry for more than 30 years She's been in sales management covering the western half of the US and Canada for Carnegie since 2011. She's got her passions are two children, a golden retriever. She loves golf. She loves hiking, skiing. She's making me exhausted already, traveling everywhere and anywhere. Leah's joining us today from her hometown of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We've also got Sarah. Sarah is, Sarah's been fantastic and just throw me over this bio. So I'm going to read it off the screen here. She's a Seattle based rep with a, with re weekly trips to BC. She went to college for business and design and she's got her accreditation from Parsons in healthy materials and sustainability. She's been a rep for five years and covers BC for Carnegie as well as a few other lines there. So let's give it over to Leah and Sarah. Off you go. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm just going to have my video on for a minute just as I introduce myself again and get this started. Having a little technical difficulty, so I'm going to turn off my uh, video. I'm going to apologize ahead of time for that because I just think it's nothing worse than listening to a presenter and not seeing them. So uh, bear with us on that, but you'll get to see Sarah, who you'll be meeting in the future anyway. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn myself off. I'm so glad I put my makeup on today. Um, okay, so um, as you well know, as uh, introduced by Jules, this is um, a CEU um, all about specifying for drapery and it's uh, everything from fabric to fabrication. So what a drapery can really transform a room, um, whether that is by, um, something, you know, putting drapery at the window and or actually creating an internal space, which is we're finding on the commercial side uh, that is happening more so than using drapery at the window, whether that's um, just to create an internal conference room by using drapery on a track, or if you have a glass um, meeting room, as you can see here on the screen, um, where you're using drapery in the glass window uh, on the right. So um, the look of a fabric sample though will not give you all the information you need to select one for a project, whether that's residential or commercial. So there's several things to consider when selecting a fabric, which is what we're gonna cover in this presentation. So the first criteria to consider 
is the construction of the fabric. And that lends itself to whether you want a lot of light transmission or if you want um, complete blackout or something in between that. So you're gonna consider how much light transmission you want. Um, you're gonna look um, at the fiber content and what's appropriate for a commercial setting. And then all the different codes that apply for using um, vertical drops in a commercial building. So there's also to consider is the uh, fabrication methods. So if you want something that looks a little more traditional, you would use like a pinch pleat, or if you want something that's modern and minimal minimalistic, you'll use more of a track system that, you know, uh, where your drapery heading is so minimal that you're really just looking at the fabric drop and not the treatment. And you'll also consider the hardware types of hardware that you want to use um, to create that space. So a drapery can dramatically impact the atmosphere of a space. So window fabric selections are often an overwhelming task because of a, a good outcome relies on choosing the right textile and the right fabrication method. So today we're gonna to give you the tools to help you build confidence in the space, in the specification of your window fabrics and to ensure that your outcome and, and your client, outcome for you and your clients will be very happy with it. So we're gonna start by, uh, by identifying the essential questions you need to ask yourself when choosing a textile for drapery. We've created a method called the four C's of fabric selection to help guide you in the right direction. So the four C's are to consider our, the codes, the content, the construction, and the type of cleaning method to be used. So we're going to start with the codes. And um, obviously, you need to, to, you need to know your end use to make sure the fabric meets whatever building codes that are um, in, the, in the area that your um, project lies. So in Canada, all fabrics used for, window, uh, for windows in a contract environment must pass the flammability test, CAN ULC S109. And in the US, in case you're designing for the US market, it has to pass NFPA 701. So this test measures the flammability yeah. of a fabric when exposed to a direct source of ignition. The flame is applied to a vertical oriented test fabric to determine the burning behavior. The test provides a means to determine the relative response to flames of fabric under low intensities of a fire exposure. Some of the toughest flame codes are for the international transportation. Um, flame tests for cruise ships are approved by the IMO or the International Maritime uh, Organization. So if you happen to design, be designing for the cruise industry, um, everything has to pass IMO. And if um, any type of airline situation is uh, what you're designing for, it's gotta be approved by the FAA. So both of them have very stringent requirements for the type of fabrics that are used in this space. So the standard flame test, and bear with me for a second, because I would be putting the flame test for the California code, but I couldn't find one good enough to put in this video. So I apologize, I am using the NFPA 701 um, US code for this, but it's the same test basically. So the standard flame test for the drapery, as I said, in the US is NFPA 701. And the test starts by exposing the fabric to a flame for 12 seconds. After 12 seconds, they remove the flame source and measure the after flame, which is the, the length of the time that the fabric continues to burn after the flame has been removed. To pass, it has to completely extinguish it within a few seconds. The next they check, check for drips. They want to see if the fabric continu continues to melt and drip during the uh, burning the material after the flame is removed. There's a maximum amount of, of time that the fabric can also continue to drip. 
And just to expand on that a little bit, obviously uh, we're talking about uh, a man-made fiber, a synthetic fiber, it will actually melt instead of just disintegrate. And those drips can actually um, catch, you know, catch something else on fire. So lastly, they check the char length, which is how far up the fabric the flame went. And there is a maximum length allowed. It's a lot of different measurements to consider. So there are a lot of ways a fabric can actually fail the test. The key is to uh, the key to a good flame retardant fabric is that they self extinguish, unlike regular flat fabrics. In the following video, you're going to see the difference, uh, what a difference having the right material can make. So there's a basket on the on the right hand side that contains a residential grade fabric, and the one on the left has uh, the fabric Travera CS polyester, which is inherently flame retardant. After 30 seconds, of fire, the fire in the waste basket, basket is starting to catch on in the conventional draperies, meaning the residential draperies. At 50 seconds, it's already a serious flame. On the left-hand side, the Travera CS curtain has melted, but the fire has not spread significantly. This means that people have time to either get out of the building or get a fire extinguisher or whatever it is determined that needs to um, stop the fire. So obviously you can see clearly that choosing the right fabric makes all the difference. So the next code to consider is related to crocking. And this is when the color rubs off on other fabrics uh, from the, uh, the original fabric that was specified. So think about blue jeans. Um, many of us are familiar with this happening on your blue jeans when the color comes off your hands on uh, onto your hands or onto your other fabric. There is so much dye in the material to get to get that good rich color, but indigo got, indigo dyes have poor color fastness, so they don't lock into the fibers very well. An extreme case of crocking will have the color coming off um, even with a light. Uh, co uh, contact. Most dyes are fine, uh, but if they've been applied and if they've been applied properly and fixed to the fi to the fibers, the actual crocking test is done by rubbing the fabric against a stocked white material. The amount of dye that comes off is then compared to an established chart, and um, a grade. There's a grade uh, of one to five that's given and they consider grades one and two are a fail. The test is done with both a dry sample and a wet one, as liquids can release more dyes than a dry surface will. Results for wet crocking usually are usually worse than those for a dry crock test. So the last code is the one you need to be, that is really important to be aware of, which is light fastness, which is in, induced by the quality of the dye. So draperies that are used at the window especially are vulnerable to losing their, their color from light exposure. Lasting qualities for a window needs to last for a, a minimum of 60 hours without any discoloration or fading. 60 hours is a standard test for indoor fabrics. The number of hours listed has to do with how long the fabrics are tested, not how many hours it's before it started to fade. It's impossible to test a fabric over years, so 60 hours is used as a standard. Based on historical experience and comparison, the industry has found that 60 hours is more than acceptable for draperies in an indoor condition. There are especially designed yarns that can, la can far surpass that, however, and last over a thousand hours, but they are intended for locations with intense light conditions, like in an outdoor space. So knowing what the light conditions are in the space you're designing will determine the light fastness that you need. When specifying for commercial use, be wary of residential fabrics. Often designers think that if a flame proof of a residential fabric is okay. Um, however, keep in mind that commercial fabrics that utilize 
the ACT symbols must also pass stringent crocking and light fa fastness tests. And just to make sure you're aware, um, ACT stands for the Association of Contact, Contract Textiles, which uh, is the organization that determines um, how a performance, how a fabric must perform in the field and what test it needs to pass for a commercial setting. So just a recap of the codes. Um, as I said, flammability for, for Canada is CAN ULC S109. Um, your crocking test needs to be a minimum of a class three out of five. And light net fastness uh, has to be a minimum of a class four, which is 60 hours to pass for indoor draperies. So the second C is content. So selecting the most appropriate content for the end use is a major consideration. So we're gonna delve a little deeper into content. As you can see, there's several drapery options pictured here. You may think that they're all made of different content, but they're actually all made of polyester. And while there may be, they're all synthetic, they, these draperies that we're looking at right now are in fact all Travera CS, which is a high quality, inherently flame retardant polyester that has been manufactured to replicate the look of natural fibers incredibly well. And uh, they're the best option for commercial settings. So, you might know that natural fibers are not the best choice for commercial uh, use. Um, in a residential setting, they're fine, but even a silk that has been added, has an added FR treatment to pass a flame code, it's not really a good choice for high abuse commercial settings. Cotton, linen, silk must be FR treated in order to pass your code, which is what we just talked about. So you can add um, an FR treatment to these fibers. However, you must be aware that if the, if the fabric's going to be washed um, a number of times, eventually that FR treatment will um, come off and needs to be retreated. So it's also worth mentioning that FR means you're also adding extra chemistry. Um, from a material health perspective, it's something that many, uh, many actively try to avoid. In fact, certain states in the US and, um, are banning the use of FR chemistry on products. And I'm sorry, I don't know if this um, is, pertains to any areas in Canada, but what we're referring to in this slide is that in California, um, they, they can't use in a commercial setting, they can't use any fabrics that have FR treatment on it because of, of the transmission into your skin. So I'm sorry, I don't really know if that's a case anywhere in California, but I mean, in, sorry, in Canada, but just wanted to make you aware of that. So by also by treating a, a fabric with an FR treatment, it also can change the hand and the color of an item. So if you're gonna go that route and have selected a fabric that needs to be treated, you always wanna see a finished sample with that treatment on it um, before you order the fabric, just in case of that, you know, if the change in hand or color is a problem for you as the designer. So only natural fibers um, that may pass are wool. Um, the only natural fiber that can pass is wool, sorry. Um, and only if it's in light in weight. This has to do with the intrinsic flammability properties of wool and its moisture retention. So what about other synthetic fibers like nylon and rayon? These are not suitable for windows. This is because they're hydrophilic fibers and they, that means they absorb, absorb moisture and will expand. Because of this, they can puddle and stretch vertically when installed. As the moisture in the atmosphere actually changes, the added water makes the fabric heavier and it doesn't necessarily recover when the moisture is removed. So all synthetics are, so not all synthetics are good for windows. So the best option for windows in a contract environment is a fabric with flame retardant properties or FR for short. An inherently flame retardant fiber or also called IFR is the optimal choice. The inherent 
means that the, the FR is added before the fiber is extruded, and thus it's an integral part of the yarn. It's permanent and it can't wash out or wear out uh, it, or wear out like a finished product can. So Traveris CS is the optimal fiber choice. It's European and it was developed um, to pass the more stringent European codes. So there is more flame retardant in the extrusion. It was also developed specifically for drapery and the hand is really soft and luxurious. So out of all the synthetic polyesters, uh, Traveris CS is what I consider the optimal um, fiber for the hand and the drape and um, just the luxury in the fabric itself. So there's other unbranded FR polyesters available um, and some polyester or polyesters blend will also work. You don't necessarily always need a 100% FR polyester. The blends, some of the blends will pass. Um, it depends on the it depends on the percentage of an FR polyester that is needed to pass the codes. If the fabric is really light in weight, often regular polyester will pass without an FR additive. It's, it relates to the function of air passage, uh, which has to have enough to extinguish a flame. So those shears that you've seen that have, you know, like are a really large, scale mesh that have uh, a lot of air uh, is able to transfer through uh, between the yarns, that doesn't necessarily have to be, have to have an FR additive to it. But your best choice is, is Traveris CS. And then the second would be an unbranded FR polyester and polyester or a blend of polyesters and FR polyester. That's a lot of polyesters, sorry. <laughs> so uh, if you're concerned, if you're really concerned about a strict flame, flame code um, or not necessarily sure what the requirements, if you're uh, designing for outside of your country, um, you're always safe to use Travera CS. Uh, they've tested the material extensively all over Europe, Asia, the US and the Middle East. So the third C is the construction. So the construction determines how well a fabric will perform. You need to know what the fabric will do. What is your intended results? So you want to just you're you're going to be determined whether how much light you want coming in the room, or how much darkness, or are acoustics actually something you want to consider. So one of the main things Draper does is, is interact interact with the light. So the light will be made will make a fabric. Uh, transparent or opaque. It's all about the construction. The construction is about how many yarns are interlacing. There are thousands of combinations of yarns and yarn sizes and spacing and weave structures. There are always ways to innovate with yarns and when they combine with the light construction, they completely change the product category. For instance, Travera created an inherently flame retardant yarn that was clear. Um, this allowed the light to come through, but when it's woven in a certain construction, that transparent drapery <clears throat> can also manage to block some of the sound uh, coming through. It's how they weave the fabric combined with a certain type of yarn. Uh, this will affect not only the light, but the amount of sound absorption. The construction, think of the construction like a grid. The bigger the spaces between the yarns, the more things that can go through the fabric. The denser the fabric, the less light moves through. Examining the fabric will help you determine how it responds to the light and look when it's hanging. So just for those that are looking for, say, a, uh, a room darkening fabric, but you want it to be a blackout, the best way to test that if it's not, if it's not uh, labeled with it as a uh, room uh, blackout, you can just hold it up to a light and you can, whether you can see a glow behind it or how much light comes through will determine whether um, that works for your space. The construction will also affect the, the ability to help with noise. A dense velvet will absorb sound, but there's actually some shears where their yarns and construction will also affect sound 
like the like I mentioned just a few minutes ago. So this can be be determined with NRC testing, meaning noise re reduction coefficient. Drapery can both be a design element as well as functional. As seen here in the cafeteria, um, in this is a European setting. This is a room with concrete floors, high ceilings, and lots of people eating and clanking their dishes. Not only does the drapery help to define the space, it also softens the edges. It, it dramatically improves the noise level in otherwise a very noisy space. The construction will not only, uh, the construction will affect not only the interaction with the light and sound, but also how it hangs. So you want your drapes to hang very clean and straight and they should never billow out and flare. And that's when you're gonna find a big, sorry, I went ahead of myself there. Um, that's where you'll find a big difference in, you know, a more expensive Travera CS compared to an inexpensive polyester. When you, when you actually um, have a large piece and let it drape, you'll notice if this, how stiff it is and whether it kind of billows out or bows out from the bottom, that's a big determining factor on getting a really good installation. So you, as I said, you can do a quick test of the fabric. You need at least 18 inches or more um, as it's hard to do with a really small fabric. Um, by just hand folding the fabric into an imaginary pleat, you'll be able to see if it billows or flares. If you're unsure, sometimes it's best to ask the workroom making your draperies and get their opinion on it. A mock-up is really the only way to uh, absolutely be sure a fabric will hang the way you want. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now for the fourth and final C. <clears throat> it's pretty straightforward. It's about all about cleaning. So proper maintenance affects the performance and the longevity of a textile. If you want the space design to look good in five years, as the day you did your final punch list, you need to make sure you've picked fabrics that, be, that can be cared for properly. You need to consider how often a fabric will be cleaned and what the maintenance limitations might be. Most window fabrics will be either machine washable or dry cleanable. We would not recommend anything that is notated it should be hand wash. Uh, you don't want to use that for a commercial setting. If you're washing it, you need to also make sure what temperature is appropriate for either that dry cleaning method or however it's going to be cleaned other than hand washing. So um, something that was designed as a privacy curtain in a healthcare setting, but used as a regular drapery can actually be washed in hot water. However, that's not the case with most drapery fabrics. Along with the temperature, you will also need to check to see if it needs a gentle cycle, how the permanently uh, attached hardware will interact the fabric uh, when it's in the washer is a big factor. Then you need to consider how you'll dry the fabric. Uh, you'll want to know whether it can go into the dryer, does it need to be hung, or will it be, and will it be ironed afterwards? Most commercial fa fabrics will have dry cleaning recommended, so you don't have to worry too much about water temperature, um, water or the temperature or ironing. However, the one thing to be aware of is that chemicals in dry cleaning can, re can remove an added FR finish over time, which is what I referred to earlier. Uh, if you do have a finish, find out how many cleans it will take before the, uh, it has to be, the finish has to be replaced. If the FR is inherent in the yarn, it will never be a problem. So those are the four C's. If you keep these in mind when you're specifying all for all your applications for windows, you should be well within the specification choices um, of the actual textile. So we just covered the fabric part of the CEO, CEU, but before I go on to fabrication, there's an important question I, you always wanna ask yourself. This is so important. You've spent X amount of money on all this textile. And then if you don't have a fabricator that does a good job on its fabrication, not only do you lose all that in installation costs and fabrication costs, but also the cost of the drapery. So having a good relationship with a, a workroom is really important. So 
uh, it's it if you get to go and if you work with a fabricator and you actually get to go and, and uh, watch their fabrication methods, it's it's kind of fun to see and inspirational to watch how they work. So now we're going to go over the uh, essential of fabrications. So you've picked a fabric and now you have to have it installed. What are your options? The first thing to consider is the, the heading type you want to use. This is how the fabric will be attached to the hardware from which it will hang. So we're going to show you three options. Please note that this is the mirror. Uh oh, did I lose you? Can you guys still see my screen? Yeah, we can still see you and hear you. Okay. Oh, this is so weird because my screen just went out. Okay. I can still go. Okay, so we're gonna go over the essentials of fabrication. Um, so keep in mind that this fabric will be attached from the hardware. Uh, so these three options were, that we're actually showing you is just three of many options you have. So the most popular heading styles for commercial projects is called the ripple fold. It's really clean and minimal in, uh, and it has a clean minimal header. It consists mainly of a ribbon which snaps on it being sewn into the top hem of the fabric. The finished fabric can then be snapped into a pre-made track. The ripple fold is one of the easiest and most economical fabrication techniques. The other advantage of using ripple fold header, header is that there is a minimum, a minimum track exposure. It can be easily hidden in the recess ceiling or even in its own. Uh, it's barely visible. Easy and economic fabrication. It's, it's a straight hem and attached by a ribbon. So it can be done very quickly. It's also very low maintenance. With so few moving parts, it's easy to install and take care of. This means it reduces maintenance time and costs. And since the ripple fold is basically flat when it comes off the track, it's really easy to clean and store. Uh, its aesthetics uh, plus points are that it looks good from both sides. Uh, though something you may want to consider is the color of the ribbon that is used um, if, it's by, if it's visible on both sides. It can be uh, run on a very long continuous track and it allows for more of the window to be exposed than other heading styles when it's open. So the next one is uh, that to be considered are grommets, which is a more casual clean option for a heading style. The advantages are similar to ripple fold in that it's quick and easy to make and it requires minimum time and money to take care of because it too can be cleaned and stored flat. But the dig, big difference from the ripple fold is that it has exposed hardware. The hardware becomes a major design feature. You should show off the most amazing uh, finales when using a grommeted curtain. Aesthetically, it too can be seen from both sides like a ripple fold. But the big drawback is that you can you cannot do continuous tracks because the hardware has to occasionally attach to the wall or ceiling, and this blocks the full, the flow of the fabric. Pleats are the most traditional of the three header styles that we're going to show you today. So the design option for pleats are huge. With grommets, uh, you can only vary the size and the color of the grommet. With ripple fold, you even have fewer options. But with pleats, there are tons of styles to choose from, like a pinch pleat, a pencil, or goblet pleat. This is just the beginning of your options. In fact, it's a great chance to work with your fabricator to come up with something really special. The other advantages of using pleated headers are that it provides a more formal or traditional appearance, and it's not limited to full fullness options, which we're going to talk about next. Now, don't get me wrong, pleats don't have to be traditional. They can add a beautiful effect with the drapery when paired with the right fabric and space. It's actually where this header shines because the nuance and the detail goes beyond grommets and ripple folds. Something to consider, however, is that once they are made, they are locked into their three-dimensional shape, which means they're not easy to clean 
nor are they easy to store. Uh, because when you take them down, they don't lie flat. Now we're gonna come to the most commonly asked questions when it comes to specifying drapery. And it has to do with figuring out how much fabric you need. Once you've picked a heading style, you'll need to measure the space you are installing um, into. There are many more measurements than what I'm gonna list here, but these are the basics. The best fabricators will come to the site and measure the windows for you. In fact, we would always recommend that a workman, workroom always is the one to get the final determination on yardage based on their measurements. Being on site ensures accurate measurements and communication much better than just a drawing. Using those measurements, they can truly partner with you to create what you want. Measurements are critical for you to determine what stacking and fullness you want. So we're gonna start with breaking down fullness. This is the amount of folds in the drapery when they are covering a window. It is how the fabric will look when it is not pushed to the side of the, of the window. There are different systems for measuring, but Ripple Fold has standard settings. So if you have a 30 inch rod, and you want 60% fullness, and that's really light traditionally on fullness, it's usually more than 60, but we're using this as an example. So if you want, if you have a 30 inch rod and you want a 60 inch fullness, then you need to add 60% of the rods width to the 30%, 30 inches already there, which is 18 inches. You're, which is 18 inches that you're gonna add. So the final 30 inches plus the 18 inches gives you a final fabric width of 48 to create 60% fullness on the ripple track. The math says the same thing with the other fullness. Ripple fold is one of the simplest uh, fullness options as the snap tape has limited set settings at either 60%, 80%, 100 or 120%. So outside of that, you do not have any other options. So that makes it a little easier to work, you know, to determine what you want to do. Other header styles can do different fullness amounts. So pleats, you can actually go up to 300% fullness. But the concept of how to calculate fullness is the same as what I showed you. As a side note, when we talk about acoustical, uh, acoustic absorbency, the test that is done to determine how much sound it absorbs, AKA the NRC test, is done at 100% fullness, which is a common number you see used in commercial spaces. Things that will contribute to your fullness uh, you'll use will be your budget. So the less fullness, the less fabric, less cost, obviously. Uh, the fabric weight and thickness. So it's all about the density they can pack. Lighter fabrics can pack in more than heavier and therefore can and may actually need more fullness to look good. Keep in mind if you're layering a sheer and an opaque as they probably do not need the same amount of fullness. Stacking or also called stack back must be considered along with the fullness when measuring your space because it's achieved when you extend the pole or track beyond the window onto the wall, thus revealing more of the window surface when the drapery is packed on the wall instead of in front of the window. In this image, you can see the heavy opaque curtains are stacked in the corner while the shears are fully open. You wanna be careful when considering fullness with different weighted fabrics. A sheer packs together much tighter than an opaque. Um, if you select the same fullness to both, they won't stack the same. As you can see, fullness and stacking are closely connected. For instance, if a space is limited, you might reduce the fullness to fit the stacking parameters. Uh, a, just a little tip when it comes to eliminating light leaks that you get with a center split installation, you should include an overlap master that places one panel in front of the other. Measurements will also be crucial in drapery, in the drapery's proper placement. 
this is a combination of where the track is placed and how deep the folds in the curtain are. You don't want the drapery to uh, project beyond the window well or hang too low below it. Or if you're using a recessed track, you'll need to make sure that it's not too wide to fit in it. If you've measured properly, your drapery will fit into its designated space. Pocket depth is the cir circumference of the fabric fold. Something else to consider if you should add a lining. Uh, a lining may be added for a very, uh, various reasons. Um, you, it can protect from elements and dirt coming through the screens to the window, through the window. It can add, also add body and weight to the face of the fabric. It can create insulation for the room, um, more light control, and it can also hide the stitching um, if you can see the reverse side of the fabric. So earlier we talked about the fact that you want to avoid uh, flare out or billowing at the bottom of your drapery installation. Um, and weights can help you avoid that. There are two types of weights. You have sausage weights, uh, which are covered tubes of beads uh, on the left photo that you see, and covered weights, which are the squares on the right. Uh, oh, hang on. Uh, am I back? We can, okay, you can hear me. I just lost power. I'm so sorry. This oh. is just, all of a sudden everything went blank. I'm sorry. So you can you still see my screen? No, we, we can just we can just uh see. Okay, sorry, hold on. Here it is. Gosh. Okay, we're almost there. How are we doing now? Can you see it? Thank you. Yep, all yes. good. Okay, cool. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so uh, square cover weights in the hem and corners will help with the flaring at the edges and corners by giving enough weight at the specific point to pull the curtain. Um, a Euro hem with a sausage weight on the fabric creates an elevated, clean, modern look. These can also be helpful when running through the hem of a light shear to help prevent it from billowing. Maybe one of the other most frequent questions you, uh, you ask is about railroading. Essentially, if you want to railroad the fabric or not, this choice can be made for either aesthetic reasons or functional reasons. If it simply, it simply means turning the fabric so instead of running as woven or vertically, it's now running horizontally or railroaded. It's impossible to tell by looking at a finished curtain if it's been railroaded. But if you have some raw material, you can see the edges. Uh, you'll see the edges and what's called the salvage. Imagine you have a striped fabric and the stripe runs horizontally from salvage to salvage. This is how it looks uh, if it, as it's woven. But turning it 90 degrees or railroading it, uh, the stripes turn into vertical. So if you choose to choose the vertical railroad, be aware that the woven width becomes the height. Keeping this in mind, you'll need to have enough fabric for your panel, thus the hem and the plus the hem and the header. One of the main inspirations to develop wide width fabrics was so that they could be railroaded to minimize the number, number of seams. So European mills uh, realized that if they wove the fabric at 118 to 120 inches wide, then the shear fabric could be turned or railroaded and you can have a huge expanse of shears without the visual, visual interference of seams. I know I am running, how am I doing on time? Um, so good, so good. Come okay, I'm all right. Okay, so I'm just doing a little <laughs> recap here. So these are the most important things to consider. And I'm sorry, I failed to replace that NFPA 701 with the Canadian code, so bear with me on that. Um, so you want to make sure that the, fast, the fabric passes your Canadian code or where, whatever um, country you're working in. Um, oops, sorry. And as well as crocking and light fastness. Um, you want to determine the intent, intended function. Like, do you need blackout? Do you want light transparency or something in between? Um, is your content appropriate for the app, for the uh, type of project you're working on. 
and matching your right fabric with the right fabrication whether to prevent billowing or flaring and make sure you do the mini hand test, as I said, um, on a sample just to make sure that it doesn't billow. So you also want to know how it's going to be cleaned and have a really good relationship with a workroom. You want to consider the fullness and the, and the stacking effect for the overall design and whether you need a lining. Um, you also can want to consider whether it can be railroaded um, or not. Um, if you have enough, um, if your height is uh, allowing you to use uh, a wide width fabric that you can run um, a, in a railroaded setting. So I'm hoping that this would empowers you with some new or reinforced knowledge. So um, I want to leave you with a couple installations that might inspire your thinking about how uh, to incorporate window fabrics into your projects. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, we are traditionally seeing uh, drapery fabric being used, as you see in this photo, to create internal space more so than at a, actually at a window, unless you're in a hospitality setting. So uh, we're finding a lot of uh, spaces that are have this beautiful um, internal um, workroom, which is just done by drapery. So they really transform a hard space as in here with all your hard surfaces. And um, they can replace walls to define these spaces. They can also create privacy in meeting rooms or even provide light control and acoustic absorbency when you're working with window walls and little wall space. They can help make a workspace feel more like an, a, a, liv a livable home space. So you can see how much, and, uh, how much impact a simple acoustic shear can make from both a functional perspective, but also visually with a splash of color. And the magic when they interact with the outdoors. So this is the end of my CEU and we can go to questions and answers if um, anybody has Thank it. you. Yeah, thanks Leah. There's a few actually. Um, okay. uh, so Sarah has been answering them along the way here, but um, I've asked Sarah if she wouldn't mind just going back over them um, okay. and, and running through uh, quick, quickly with those ones. We've got a few minutes here for questions and then I've got another one or two through we're here as well. So thanks, Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so I try to answer these questions as best I could, Leah, as you were speaking. So the first one, it wasn't a question, but it was going to be a question, which was those temperatures were in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. So I went ahead and made a conversion in the, in the um, chat. Um, so don't worry, you don't have to cook your <laughs> your textiles at 60 degrees Celsius. Please don't do that. Um, okay, so the next question was, with IFR or FR testing meet UL or ULC testing standards? If so, what is a UL or ULC reference number? Um, I responded with, it will depend on the drapery, and IFR and FR refer to the acoustical finish, I didn't mean to say acoustical, I meant to say flame finish, added to the fiber that meets different ULC standards. So it, it they're two different things. Um, and please feel free, Leah, to jump in and correct me on anything. Um, okay. The material that okay. is FR or IFR needs to additionally be tested to meet UL or ULC standards. So um, the equivalent is NFPA 701, which is the US, is equivalent to the ULC S109. Now, you're, it, it is very similar testing, but it does need to be tested for both. So you want to make sure it has the, for, your, for you, the ULC S109. Um, and I also added a link that goes over what that testing is and how they determine based on spread rate, how they meet that S109 standard. Um, and then the final question in here, um, do you know if Trivera CS is, meets well standard? I did say, yes, it does. Um, but let me know what specifically you need for your, to, get, to gain that well credit on your, your product so I can make sure you have the proper documents. There's one more question down there from Philip. He's on fire today. Yeah, Philip, you are, I, I love it. I love the energy. If the product has a class A rating, this means FSR is 25 or below when you pick a fabric. 
will it state whether it is class or state? Or state is FSR, i.e. flame spread ratio. Okay, so class A fire rating is again, the same as um, the NFPA 701. That is what is technically class A fire rated. There are different classes that are below class A that are not, that did not, we did not highlight. Um, so UL, ULCS 109 is technically class A fire rated, mm -hmm. but class A fire rated typically refers to US versus you most of the time when I when I hear it from you um, in Canada, you are specifically asking for S109. Any input, Leah? <laughs> no, I think you handled it well. Thank you. Um, I, sorry for the failure on the Celsius. <laughs> I was trying to make sure I got all the Canadian codes in there. I didn't even think about that. Um, okay. I'm, yeah. I'm uh, engaged to a Canadian, just so that everybody here knows. So <laughs> I have to constantly convert between kilometers and miles and Celsius and Fahrenheit. I learned that one really fast. I have another couple of uh, questions here that have come through on the direct chat. So um, we may have touched on, on one of them, especially with those last questions one, but one of them was uh, when putting together a spec or an RFP for a commercial project, what would you suggest we made sure we included in that spec? For example, what's essential versus what's nice to have? Would we be going so far as specifying headers and heading styles, et cetera? Uh, absolutely. You want to, you as the designer, you want to determine everything about the construction. Like I said, because if you don't, you know, if you didn't say, okay, this is a very minimal space, you know, it's very contemporary or modern and, you know, you don't want a lot of hardware exposure or whatever, you know, if you didn't determine um, that you wanted a ripple fold or something like that, you can end up with, you know, a pinch pleat. And we can follow up. Um, we've got a lot of information that we're going to send you afterwards that will address everything we talked about. But you as a designer, you want to make sure you're specifying, you know, the header, the hem, you know, whether it can be railroaded, you know, anything about how it's going to turn out, you want to determine. But if you ever have any questions about that, that's again where your workroom can really help you out and say, a lot of times we'll have uh, designers when they'll come back and ask us like, would, would this particular fabric be good use with this fabrication? We tell them to on the safe side to get, we'll send samples to your fabricator and say, this is the look we're trying to achieve. Will this fabric act and perform in the way we want? and look good doing it because there's certain fabrics that are either stiffer than others or something like that. So that's again, where this drapery workroom um, is, is so important to you, but yes, everything else about it, you want, you want to determine how, it, how it's going to look and in, um, in the, you know, everything even down to the hardware. And okay. just, um, just to add to Leah's very quickly, I did put together a, a quick recap email that I will send out to everybody. And in that is included a PDF that has just quick, um, like what to look at when you're specifying. Now, you obviously don't have to use all of it, just use as much as you think is going to work for your project, but it'll be a good guideline. And it's really organized and really pretty to look at for those of us who can get <laughs> claustrophobic with huge big texts. We have another question here. Thanks for that. That's great. Um, that's a really good uh, thing for us to be able to share out as well there. But there's another question from, from wonderful Philip. Um, final question. Is there off-gassing from new fabric? Good question. That is such a good question. And because Carnegie is all about no finish is the best finish just for you know for this not only the smell of it or off gassing of it um so that's where inherently flame retardant fabrics are better because it is an integral part of the structure of the yarn and it can't be washed off therefore it's also not off gassing when you're when you're smelling a fabric and it has some kind of a chemical smell it's because it's been treated it's either been treated with fr treatment or even a stain retard uh, a stain finish can, you know, have an off-gassing effect. So that's a really good question. And we, we offer these things because it's really demanded from our client if in certain situations, but Carnegie is an advocate of no finish is the best finish. So if you can select a fabric that performs um, for your application, then without it, it, out some type of a treatment, that is the better way to go. It's awesome. And again, just to add to Leah, I'm so sorry, Leah, I keep doing this to you, but 
Um, just to make it more technical, it does meet SCS Indoor Advantage Gold, which is in VOC third-party um, certification. So and that's the Travera CS. That's the Travera CS. Yes. So I know we only have a minute. I do want to close with um, Sarah, as she mentioned, she um, she's located in in uh, Seattle, but she goes about every two weeks to the Vancouver area, and. Um, all the photographs in, in my presentation, everything you see is a Carnegie fabric. So as you can tell by the beauty of our offering, um, we can happily supply you with all kinds of beautiful uh, fabrics to create drapery. Or we also, I hope all of you guys know, we also do, uh, Carnegie provides upholstery wall covering, uh, vinyl alternative wall covering because we don't sell vinyl. Um, we have acoustical treatments as well. So many of these things. And um, Sarah's available to come in to do presentations to any of you. And um, I'm going to come up and work with her in May. So I would love to meet with all of you if we could. Perfect. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody, for joining the Chase webinar series. Really good energy today. Please uh, make sure you fill out that survey you'll receive so we can learn more about what we can make different for you in the future. And don't forget to register for the um, the the CEU on the 20th of April, which is, uh, uh, where have I put it down? I know it's it's what, from well to wellness. Well, something like that. Anyway, it's all there. And it's all about the well building standards, intelligent, interesting, human-centric design. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. We'll see you again soon.